All systems are go here. We are uh, continuing on this study about authority. Um, this started last week, and uh, you know all of the, I guess the records that we do have of uh, lessons of the past are all at South Austin Church of Christ.org or on YouTube. Um, seems to be easy enough to find them on YouTube, actually. But uh, we began to talk about religious authority because, uh, well, it's just a large topic and something I've been thinking about for a long time about how to address this or how to approach this, maybe uh, kind of anew or from the top. Um, most studies are that I do are, are starting over. Um, and this was not a, an exception. So the, the first thing that we did was to accept or to recognize in Scripture that God uses his word to create everything and that he has chosen his word as the mechanism by which he will accomplish everything that he wants to accomplish and get his will done on earth. Um, we looked at the creation. We looked at Isaiah 55 and other things of this nature. Uh, in the evening, we looked at establishing authority by letting um, by letting our will be his will, which is to say that we turn these words in the Bible into our actions in life. And uh, looked at a couple of examples of that, of how they took the Lord's Supper and, and how therefore we do, and how they... Um, worshipped in, in uh, song and how we do as well. Um, this morning we looked at Achan and the account there in Joshua, really six through eight, with the main point being that if you allow God to prescribe what you do, then you succeed. If you go on ahead without what God said to do, then you're going to fail. It's going to be a problem. Something like Aiken will trip you up in that case. So here uh, today, this or this evening, or afternoon, where are we? <laughs> this is the central time zone, right? Yeah, so it's, uh, it's afternoon, late afternoon, and uh, we're looking at what I call unnecessary inferences as we look at fundamentals of religious authority. I want to focus on the authority aspects of Scripture and, and of the account that we're looking at in the altar of witness. I say unnecessary inferences, not because inferences aren't real or binding, uh, which they are. They are real and they are binding, and I realize they're the first thing to get attacked by people who are not actually interested in authority at all. They're interested in getting out of authority, out from under it. <laughs> That's not what I mean. What I mean is... Uh, just as much as we allow God to prescribe what should be said or should be done, it is also the case that there are some things that are okay and ought to be seen as not legislated. And there are choices that can be made, things that can be done that are clean in and of themselves, and that is ex also an acceptable thing. Um, I choose the altar of witness for this, because it is a good example of um, things that are acceptable, even if they are not necessarily spelled out, they stay within the boundaries of what is spelled out. But it's also the case that the people themselves drew, um, tried to draw together what happened with Achan in Joshua 7 and what they thought was happening in the altar of witness. And that tells me this is the thing that we need to make clear for ourselves. Surely Achan was a bad guy and he did wrong. And because he did wrong, it hurt the people. That's true. But actually the bigger problem, you know, Achan is going to happen. You're going to have somebody who is overtaken in the trespass. You're going to have somebody who takes on something they should not do. People, members of the congregation, have done a lot of things. We've had people steal from the treasury. We've had people use drugs. Uh, we've had a lot of things happen. Every congregation of any, you know, lifespan has had a lot of things happen. <laughs> They're going to happen. The question is, what do you do about it? 
how do you respond to this? Do you sweep it under the rug? Do you look the other way? Or do you care enough about the souls that God has entrusted to the congregation to do something to help them, um, to address that matter? And so the problem for Achan was not so much that Achan happened. That's going to happen. The problem was that the people didn't respond appropriately. They didn't check with God what he wanted them to do. And this resulted in death when they tried to go on in battle and God wasn't with them. But what you find later in Joshua 22 is that the people didn't draw that conclusion and they should have. So um, I'm drawing it for us. In Joshua 22, 20 is where the people said, didn't Achan break faith in the matter of devoted things and wrath fell on the whole congregation of Israel? And he didn't perish alone for his iniquity. These people, and, and this, this is an argument lifted out of context, and we'll get to the context, but what they're asserting here is that, yeah, everybody loses their lunch or loses their recess because little Johnny was chewing gum. That that's the way that God works. You know, maybe your kindergarten teacher was like that. It was mean and not fair. But and and they have, you know, they can do whatever they want. That's their classroom. But that's not actually how God works. <laughs> that Achan did something wrong in private that nobody knew or had a way of knowing. And therefore, the whole congregation is guilty. No, that's not how God works. The reason why the people perished was not Achan's iniquity. Let me put it that way. He did have iniquity. He did do wrong. It was the immediate, proximate cause of the trouble but there was something else happening there. This is not the right conclusion. See, what, what happens when you go down this road, of uh, well, Achan had this thing, it was hidden, it was in his tent. This is how brethren go down this totally wrong path of, therefore, we need to know what every individual member is doing in the privacy of their own homes, lest they do something wrong, that, and we have fellowship with it, and therefore God takes away our candlestick. Yeah, no, that's not right. That is not taught in Scripture. <laughs> there is such a thing as individual responsibility. Um, some things are clear. Some things are not clear. Uh, Paul told Timothy very plainly, the deeds of some are obvious and precede them to the judgment. The deeds of others cannot remain hidden. Yeah. And the secret things belong to God, right? And they're you know, do not judge before the time. God will bring to light all the things that are hidden. There are many things, places that tell us, no, the lesson of Achan is not we need to implement a tent digging program. We got to go around everybody's tent and dig under there and see if they got anything hidden. N no, that's not right. That's not right. That's a lot closer to being the guy in Matthew 25 who goes to his fellow servants and, and requires them to pay him back so that he can pay the master. Yeah, it's a lot closer to being that. And that guy's clearly condemned in Matthew 25. <laughs> no, that's not what the that's not the right lesson. That's not the right conclusion. Okay. So we're here to get the right one. Um, Joshua 22, let's look at the altar of witness together for what it really is. You find in the ninth verse of Joshua 22 that some of the tribes specifically Reuben, Gad, and half-tribe of Manasseh, parted from the rest of the people at a specific point in the land, Shiloh, in, in a specific point named Shiloh. Why did they part from them there? Because they went home to the land of Gilead. What's Gilead? Well, it's, it's a portion of land short of the Jordan as you're moving west. You know, they came up from the south and out to the east, and then they came into the west, if you will. So it's a portion of the land short of the Jordan. Shiloh is, has crossed over the Jordan. So here they are on the other side, on the west side of the Jordan, and the people are saying, we're going to go home now. We're going back to our land in Gilead. How do they get the land? Well, it says... It's their own land of which they had possessed themselves by command of the Lord through Moses. So what does it mean? Well, it means God gave them this land. It's okay. That is home. And they are allowed to go home. This is all, this is all okay. God gave it to them by command through Moses. 
This is a settled matter. It's a done deed. No pun intended on deed. Joshua 22.10, when they came to the region of the Jordan in the land of Canaan, so they got back to the Jordan. They're about to cross over to their land, and they stop. Reuben, Gad, and half Manasseh built there an altar by the river Jordan, an altar of imposing size, which is to say a huge altar, not something that a human being could actually use. And the people of Israel, oh, hold on a minute. Yeah, so they built this thing. Sorry, before I move on, it's an imposing size. It's not the kind of thing that a person could actually use. But more than that, what does it mean that they built this huge altar? If it's so big that you can't actually get up there, you can't actually use it, you couldn't tie any sacrifices to the horns of the altar because it's, you know, whatever, 30 yards across or something. Well, what's it for? My point is, you don't know what it means. The fact that it has been constructed doesn't tell you anything. Now, the 11th verse, though, this did not prevent the rest of the tribes from believing or thinking that they knew exactly what it meant. <laughs> they thought, wow, well, this means it's time to spill blood. Let's go make war on our brethren over a thing that we're not even sure what it means. That's not a good idea, guys. Right? 11th verse, people of Israel heard it. Behold, people of Reuben, Gad, half tribe Manasseh built the altar at the frontier of the land of Canaan, in the region nearby the Jordan, on the side that belongs to Israel. Okay, yes, this much is established. And when the people heard of it, the whole assembly of the people gathered at Shiloh to make war against them. So their thought is, it's time to make war. Because, why? Because they built this large, you know, this outsized altar on the Israel side of the Jordan. That seems a little us and them already, doesn't it? That feels a little bit of us and them attitude, which is not right. We're brethren, right? But they've gathered to make war already because they heard that this altar had been constructed. And then the 13th verse continues this. At that time, the people of Israel sent to the rest of them in the land of Gilead. They sent them, first of all, Phinehas, son of Eleazar the priest. Now, you may recall Phinehas from the incident of Baal Peor. He had God's covenant of peace because he stopped the plague in connection with uh, their fornication with Moab and the worship of the Moabite gods. But he did that by thrusting through a royal couple with a sword. Nonetheless, it's what God intended to have happening there because they were making peace with foreign gods of the foreign lands that they were coming into. And that, that was never God's intent for the people Thousands of people died in the plague at the hands of God because of this evil. Phineas checked that plague by putting an end to it. Now the people send Phineas out to make war, though. He had God's covenant of peace, but now he's being sent to make war. That is unfortunate. You do need people that have a spine. As they say, you need the three, you need the three bones, right? You need three bones. You need a wishbone, you need a backbone, and you need a funny bone, right? Or maybe it's the other way around. Wishbone, funny bone, and backbone. That's what you need. Yeah. You do need to have guys that have a backbone that will stand up for the truth and that will say something, even if it's not popular and even if people don't like it. You do need that. But we're not in the business of making war, and uh, we're not in the business of drawing hasty conclusions about brethren or anybody else.
But yeah, this reference to Phineas comes back in the 17th verse as well. But the, who else is going? It's Phineas to uh, also with 10 chiefs, one from each of the tribal families of Israel, that is the 10 who weren't living in Gilead, everyone the head of a family among the clans of Israel. They got there to Gilead and addressed the other tribes, saying, Thus says the whole congregation of the Lord. And I stop you right there. My first question is, who? <laughs> Wait a minute, who? Thus says the whole congregation of the Lord. <laughs> thus says the whole congregation of the Lord. Like, no, it's not thus says the Lord. That would be okay. If the Lord had said, that'd be one thing. That's not what happened. The people said, well, who are you? Since when do we listen to the whole congregation of the Lord versus the Lord? And it's good when we care what brethren are thinking and when brethren who care about you address you and speak to you in the name of the Lord. That's how discipline works. And we need that. But that's not what we're talking about here. This is a group who have assembled to kill them. They want to make war. And they have said that they're, the basis of their authority is the whole congregation of the Lord. Well, it's not the whole congregation of the Lord. It's ten and a half tribes, or ten tribes, whatever, nine and a half. Thus says the whole congregation. No, that's not true. And even if it were true, it wouldn't make it right. What God says is what's right, not what the people agree to. I always remember a certain individual, and Emily always remembers too, but I always remember a certain individual who would uh, unpredictably um, object to my lessons. I say unpredictably. It was predictable she'd have something to object about, but unpredictably... Like, as in, I never knew what she was going to object to, because the basis of her object, objection was, that's not how they taught it when I was growing up. I never heard them say that. And, you know, at first I would try to be like, well, is this not scriptural? Is this not well? But, you know, there was not a way that they could have gotten this, you know, they lived their whole lives and they've already died and gone on to their reward, you know, and I was like, well, I didn't know you were alive in the days of Moses and Jesus. But, you know, I, as far as I can tell, this is consistent with the words of the Bible, <laughs> right? Well, it doesn't matter what you heard growing up, what they said or what they didn't say. Uh, that's between them and their God. And if they were wrong about something, they don't want you to be wrong too, just because they were. If anything, Jesus said that rich man who went to punishment wished that his brothers would not follow him there. Uh, so if they got something wrong, and I, you know, that that's, remains to be seen, they don't want you to get it wrong too, just because they did. The, the worst mistake, I think, about appealing to the authority of the congregation of the people, the church, the history of the church. You know, you're looking back at it and you're, you're wondering, especially when I think of like restoration heritage as, as it is called. Um, it, people are spending a lot of time looking back at a group of people to see what they were doing. And that group of people was exactly precisely not doing that. If they had been looking back the same amount of time to see what they were doing, they would have stayed Baptist. They would never obey, obey the gospel. Because that's not authority, friend. And if you could pull them out of the grave and shake their hand today, they would tell you the Bible is right. Do what the Bible says. Right? That, that'd be, that's such a huge mistake. But it's very common. That's why we pointed out here. All right. What did the people say? What is this breach of faith that you have committed against the God of Israel, turning away this day from following the Lord by building yourselves an altar this day in rebellion against the Lord? This is what you call a loaded question. <laughs> the loaded question, like, have you stopped beating your wife yet? You cannot say yes 
because then they say, well, why were you beating her? And you cannot say no, and then they will say, why don't you stop? That's a loaded question, and this one is loaded too. What is this breach of faith you have already committed? Well, that isn't, that remains to be seen. They're assuming too much, right? They're assuming that this is a breach of the faith. That's not been proven. They've assumed that it's already done. It has been committed already, the, the sin that is obvious, whatever that is, has already been accomplished. They're turning away from following the Lord. Why? Because they're, because they're turning, they're literally turning away to go back to Gilead? You have to wonder about that. Is there too much emphasis on the physical? Building an altar in rebellion against the Lord. Well, this is also not so. That's not a necessary conclusion. None of these is a necessary conclusion. There's no indication that they've committed or done anything. There's no indication that it's contrary to the faith in God to build some large obviously memorial or replica of some kind. They've assumed too much, is what I'm getting at. And that 18th verse, if you too rebel against the Lord today, tomorrow he'll be angry with the whole congregation of Israel. That's what we said before. This is actually incorrect. That's not how God works. He's not trying to trip us up. Yes, we love the brotherhood. And yes, you are your brother's keeper. And I'm not for the people that bury their head in the sand and, and say that they're, you know, they hide behind local autonomy when they won't identify error in the churches or false teachers who are making the circuit. That, that's not scriptural at all. But God is not waiting for one person to do wrong so that he can condemn the whole congregation to hell. That's not what he wants. He wants us to be saved. <laughs> He's for us, not against us. That's not the nature of our God. And that's why they said what they did in the 20th verse. Didn't Achan break faith in the matter of devoted things and wrath fell on all the congregation? He didn't perish alone for his iniquity. See, therefore the tent digging program. Therefore the evil surmisings. Guilty until proven innocent. That's what they're trying to do. And I stand firmly opposed to that, brethren. You will hear otherwise if you're asked, but that is, I stand firmly opposed to that. <laughs> that is not at all what I believe and ever has been. No, they're wrong about this. They've concluded incorrectly, and I'm afraid a lot of brethren have, that they're going to be held responsible for the sinful actions of other people as if it is their responsibility to be the Lord's private investigator, figure out what's happening in the privacy of people's homes or anything that maybe they might be hiding from the congregation. That's just not scriptural, friends. That's the wrong conclusion from what happened with Achan. We talked about it at length this morning, but I go back to it um, in, at least in, in uh, this thought that look, the reason why Israel was harmed by what Achan did is that they didn't ask God first before they went out to war again. And it was never the case that the people won their, their you know, military victories by means of the strength of their military. It was God who delivered them. It was faith. Hebrews 11.30, that caused the walls of Jericho to fall, not the prowess of the Israelite army. It was their faith in God. So they went to war again after Jericho without first asking God whether they should do so and, and what to do. If they had asked him first, he would have told them, no, no. Do not go to war. You cannot succeed because I am not with you because there is sin in the camp. And that whole exercise of figuring out who it is, because Achan was not honest, he was hiding, and 
figuring out that his family was in collusion with him to hold on to the valuable uh, possessions. You know, that whole process could have happened before they went to war again and lost dozens of people. They did not have to die. And yeah, it has something to do with Aiken, that's true. But it has more to do and primarily to do with the fact that they didn't ask God first. So here, when the people come to accuse the citizen or the, the, the inhabitants of Gilead of wrongdoing, and they say, well, Achan did not perish alone for his iniquity, that's really only half true. The fact is, Israel died for their own iniquity, not Achan's. And their iniquity was presumptuous sin. They presumed and assumed that God was with them without checking. They weren't looking for, thus says the Lord, before they go to battle. And when that same AI was attacked subsequently in Acts, or I'm sorry, in Joshua chapter 8, after the incident with Achan, the Lord said, See, I have given AI into your hands. Go take it. And they did. That's how it should have been from the beginning. The reason Israel died, you know, to say, well, he didn't perish alone for his iniquity. That's only half true. He didn't perish alone, and his iniquity did affect other people. I get it. A little leaven leavens a whole dump, uh, the whole lump, and we're told about discipline in 1 Corinthians 5, and churches today are not doing it, and they should be doing it, unless they think that the devil has, is on vacation or hell is full, or they turn down the temperature, or something like that. I'm not sure, but nothing like that I find in Scripture. I get it. But he didn't die, or the people didn't die for his iniquity. He died for his iniquity. The people died for presumption. So what you're seeing here is they've come up with this policy. We have to detect and eradicate private sin from the lives of the members. That is going to lead to a whole lot of problems. That is going to lead to a whole lot of other things that are not authorized and that are sinful. And the irony of this you know, the irony of this is that the death of innocent people in the battle of Ai could have been avoided if they had just asked the Lord first. Uh, Achan was going to die anyway because he was dishonest. But they could have taken Achan out and then gone on to chapter 8 without losing dozens of good people. The irony of that is that here in the 22nd chapter, they didn't draw that conclusion. They drew the conclusion that they needed to be at each other's throats. Satan loves that. But that's not right. What's right is they could have avoided this chapter if they had just asked the Lord first. The Lord didn't tell them to assemble to make war against their brothers. You know they didn't ask God. Well, the response from Reuben, Gad, and half Manasseh is, begins at verse 21. The mighty one, God the Lord, the mighty one, God the Lord, he knows. And let Israel itself know. This is exactly right. God knows. And it is true. He does know our hearts. If it was in rebellion or breach of faith against the Lord, do not spare us today for building an altar to turn away from following the Lord. Or if we did so, to offer burnt offerings or grain offerings or peace offerings on it at all. May the Lord himself take vengeance. The first thing they said is, this is not rebellion, this is not breach of faith, and if it is, we don't object to dying. If we built this altar in order to turn away from God, then may God himself take vengeance. If we had any plan to make an offering on this altar... That's not what we're doing. 24 says, no, we did it from fear that in time to come, your children might say to our children, 
What do you have to do with the Lord, the God of Israel? They're afraid that because they have relocated to Gilead on the other side of the Jordan, that some future generation might draw, decide that they're going to draw the boundary at the Jordan and exclude these children from Israel. The real purpose of the altar is to remind these future generations that these Gilead, these uh, citizens or people living in Gilead are in fact the people of the Lord even though they live on this side of the Jordan. This is clean. That's perfectly clean. Ain't nothing wrong with that at all. The Lord has made the Jordan a boundary between us and you, the you, uh, people of Reuben, people of Gad. You have no portion in the Lord. That's what they're afraid of. In the future, some generation might say, God made the Jordan the boundary. You guys have no portion in the Lord, so your children might make our children cease to worship the Lord. And that's a good thing to be concerned about. You do want to think about the faithfulness of the next generation. Therefore, we said, 26, let us now build an altar, not for burnt offering nor sacrifice, but to be a witness between us and you between our generations after us, that we do perform the service of the Lord in his presence with our burnt offerings, sacrifices, and peace offerings so that your children will not say to our children in time to come, you have no portion in the Lord. So the, the whole purpose of this altar is to stand there a witness, as they said. This thing is there to remind you that we look your way when we are thinking about the altar of the Lord. And it's outsized like that because it's a feature of the land for everybody who lives nearby to see it and realize Israel, you know, the tent, the tabernacle is that way. And these people are part of us, even though they're across the Jordan. So no, this is okay. This is clean. There's nothing wrong with this. It, it, it's not a rival altar. It was not made to make sacrifices on it. It seems like it wasn't even possible to do so. It was made as a memorial or as a, a, a monument of some kind that memorializes their agreement that they're part of Israel even though they're settled across a river, which is a very common way to draw a boundary, said the Texan. So verse 31, Phineas said to the people, today we know the Lord is in our midst because you have not committed this breach of faith against the Lord. Now you have delivered the people of Israel from the hand of the Lord. But Phineas is right about this. And we'll look at this a little bit more slowly. Today we know the Lord is in our midst. What does it mean that God is among them? Because you have not, in fact, committed a breach of faith. What he means is God is among them because they were kept from sinning. Today we know, as in we get it now, they were kept from sinning. How do you know they were kept from sinning? Because he says... In fact, you have delivered the people of Israel from the hand of the Lord. You understand what that means? That means if the majority had gone ahead to make war against the minority over this completely innocent and clean matter, then the God of Israel would have become their enemies. He would not have approved of that. So because these have acted faithfully in providing a signpost to future generations and because they were able to answer when questioned, they saved the people from God who would be mad at them. And this is very similar to the incident at Baal Peor because... Um, 
it was the plan of uh, Balaam, the soothsayer, to have God get mad at the people by causing the people to worship other gods. That's what worked. He couldn't curse them directly. Moab couldn't beat them directly. But if he could get the people to join in their sacrifices, then God would curse them. And that's exactly what happened. 24,000 Israelites died. So here, if the people had continued on their original plan to make war over this thing that was actually in and of itself clean, then God would have had a heavy hand with them. And so it is with us too. The fact is that there are some things that really are matters of basic indifference to the Lord. Um, and maybe you think this is not a real danger, but it is a real danger. I know it's a real danger. I've seen this happen. Um, there was a place that I had visited a few times um, where, you know, it seemed like they were faithful and it seemed like they were strong. And, and But over time in my studies with the elders of that congregation, I came to understand that they believed there was no modern application for Romans 14 whatsoever. Brethren never had any cause to disagree about anything or to have different judgments about anything. Um, and I wasn't sure what, where they were coming from at first, because it's true that there's no reason we can't understand the Bible. We can always agree on what the Bible says. And we must do so. Um, but it started to make sense as I started to think about the practices that I had seen there. For example, in their Bible class, I noticed that they didn't call on people um, or people didn't raise their hands. They just went person by person and made you answer a question. Every member of the whole congregation was required to speak. And I know that there are sometimes uh, women who feel that they, they're afraid of um, being out of subjection in some way. I don't think that's uh, necessarily true in Scripture. We find that we're all of us speaking and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. You all speak during the assembly all the time. But it's okay if you wish not to comment and you do so because of your concern about um, about modesty and, and godliness and uh, subjection. I can't see a reason to, to be mad about that or to object to that. But these elders did. They said, well, no, it's not required, and you have to believe that it's not required, and you have to practice it too. Not enough to accept what the scriptures teach about it. You also have to conform to our practice. Yeah, that's a different matter, right? And um, we had, a, Emily and I had a friend, a good person, who was from West Virginia, and she wore head covering uh, on her head, and that's, that's all right. You're allowed to do that. Again, she wants to show modesty. She wants to show subjection. She doesn't require us to do it. She didn't think Emily was not faithful because she's not wearing a head covering. She wouldn't say that. She doesn't believe that. But, you know. We told her about this place, and she visited there, and they really gave her a hard time about that head covering. A visitor, somebody they didn't even know. I called the elders. What do you mean by treating my friend this way? You know, And, and their response to me was, well, nobody's going to yank it off of her head. That was the response, honestly. An elder in the Lord's church. And I said to him, oh, I'm glad that you stopped short of physical assault when I send members, when I send you visitors. That's great to know. Thank you for that vote of confidence, right? People have to understand, no, there are some things that are basic indifference to the Lord. No, modesty is not indifferent. No, subjection is not indifferent. But if you choose to show subjection by wearing a head covering, okay. If you choose to show subjection by being quiet in class, okay. There's no sin in this. There's nothing wrong with that at all. 
I don't don't condemn it. I would never condemn it. I don't know why you would condemn it. What business is it of yours? Why do you care? <laughs> why discourage somebody, you know, who has so much honesty and so much genuineness about their faith that they're willing even, you know, to do something that a lot of people might uh, think is odd or might frown upon? Why condemn somebody like that? I applaud them. So no, you have to accept that there are things that people do um, that can be right, that can be okay, that, that are just not met, legislated. It's just not, it doesn't matter to God. It was legislated in 1 Corinthians 11, somebody says about the head covering. All right. Yes, it's legislated there, but there it's actually a burqa, not a head covering. And her hair is given to her in place of or in exchange for a head covering. If her hair is feminine and modest, then she is appropriately attired. We can talk about that offline. If you have more questions, I'll show you the Greek. Now, uh, the other thing about this, when we talk about matters of indifference, and again, I tell you, it, these are real dangers because you got brethren making war over things that don't need to be warred. They don't, we don't need any more division. We have enough. But God definitely commanded the tribes to worship, and he commanded the tribes to worship at the altar that's in the tabernacle. They were not to make an altar for worship that was other than the one that he had. True. He also allowed some of the tribes to stop short of the promised land, if you will, the original charter, to stay on the east side of the Jordan. He did allow that. In fact, we saw that he gave it to them by commandment through Moses. It would certainly, though, be sin if, on the other hand, some tribe, some some tribes, some of their children in the future decided to prevent other tribes from worshiping God. All of these are definitely wrong. Right, so it's it's okay. God commanded them to worship at one altar. They wouldn't make another altar to worship. That wouldn't be allowed. God allowed them to stop short and to live in the Jordan, There's no, or to live on the other side of the Jordan. There's no issue with that. It doesn't mean that they aren't as committed, that they're not as much a part of Israel or anything like that. And it certainly would be a sin if in some future generation, others said, oh yeah, Jordan is the border, you're not Israel anymore, stop coming here to worship. Or let's say that somebody set up some calves at Dan and at Bethel and said, you've gone long enough to Jerusalem. Not that anybody would do that. But how do you prevent this, right? How do you remind people about this? How do you teach about this? How do you illustrate this truth? The fact is that it's not legislated. You can teach in a lot of different ways. You can set up reminders in a lot of different ways. The fact that they made this replica altar, this monument or memorial to remind people is clean in and of itself. Worshiping there would be a problem. That would be a sin, but nobody's doing that. And that's why we call it, um, or well, I say we, um, that's why I call it what I do, unnecessary inferences. We have to be you know, we have to be firm on what the Bible does say. We have to let God prescribe. And absolutely, you can and you must understand the Bible. God speaks light into existence. And he speaks us into existence as Christians. His word makes Christians. You absolutely can and must understand the Bible. And I know that the majority of the churches don't believe that anymore. They now believe that you can't understand the Bible alike. The Bible notwithstanding, I guess. God said his word doesn't come back to him empty. It accomplishes what he sent it to do. But you also have to respect the silence of the scriptures. There is judgment. There are things that people do about which God is basically indifferent. There's more than one way to teach. There's more than one way to remind. There's more than one illustration that can be used. There are different you know, practices. If somebody wants to wear 
a head covering, that is fine. Somebody wants to eat kosher, that is fine. I recommend, you know, don't barbecue tofu. If you're going to eat tofu, eat tofu, but let it be tofu. Don't say it's barbecue. It's not. But, said the Texan. But, truly, those are matters of indifference to God, and that's fine. We have to understand that authority as well. Put the emphasis where it really belongs and focus on what God intends, that we do walk in the unity of the faith, in the prescription of the scriptures, and that we don't be at each other's throats, that we don't be looking for reasons to disagree or to have problems. You do need to have somebody with a backbone who will stand up for the truth. And there certainly are a lot of churches that are just not strong anymore. But we don't need to borrow trouble either. So I hope that that's a useful thing, and I hope that's a balanced uh, approach. And by all means, let me know any questions or concerns or anything else on this or any other lesson. I'm just a man. If today you are not a Christian, it's time to become a Christian. Be obey God, believing in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Be buried in baptism for the forgiveness of your sins by means of of the washing and the regeneration that comes through the blood of Jesus and through his word. You will be putting to death the old person of sin, that you might be raised from the dead, a new person created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. If you are a Christian who has done these things but have not maintained the obligation of Ephesians 2.10, to walk in these things carefully through life, repent, return to your first love, and let us pray for you that you can be restored to him. None of us has achieved a sinless perfection. None of us has gotten to the point where we no longer need the blood of Jesus. This is a place where we are the children of God, and you can say, I need help, I need prayers, and we will help and we will pray because we want to get to heaven and we want you to be there too. If you need the prayers of the saints, if you need to be baptized, let it be known by coming to the front while we stand and sing.